So hello everyone, I will be sharing my screen. Welcome to week seven. So um, this is week seven, I'm sorry, it didn't click, but there we go. So welcome to Epidemics of Injustice. And so we were able to um, make some tweaks to make sure everything was right. And the theme is co-disruption for collective liberation in public health. Um, so please, as uh, you were asked before, please introduce yourself in the chat with your names and pronouns. Uh, please complete the check-in form or scan the QR code uh, during the presentation. Put comments or questions in the chat and there will be time for questions at the end. So we have been sharing this. So if we have a Google site and we have the Blackboard site and um, there are instructions on how to open the chat, how to start video if you want to be seen or not, and how to mute yourself on the microphone. Here are the course instructors and the teaching assistants. So we have Katie, Nandini, and myself, Wushika Torres. About the course, this annual course is free and open to the public and it prepares public health leaders and community members with the tools to bring about social change and address structural determinants of health. All course meetings will take place virtually. This course is open to students and the public from 5.30 to 6.30 p.m. CST. Students taking the course for credit will stay from 6.30 to 7.30 for a closed discussion. Epidemics of Injustice is sponsored by the Collaboratory for Health Justice at the USC School of Public Health. And we would also like to thank Radical Public Health for the creation, support, and promotion of this program. RPH is celebrating its 11th year. For more information about RPH, please visit the Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash Radical Public Health. Content warning. Sorry. Today's lecture contains material that might be difficult to discuss. Please step away if you need to take care of yourself during the presentation. So we'd also like to open with our land acknowledgement. <clears throat> Today, uh, the Collaboratory for Health Justice acknowledges that the University of Illinois Chicago resides on the traditional territories of the three fire peoples, the Ojibwe, the Ottawa, and the Badawanami. Badawanami. Purchased after two and a half years of open warfare, decades of violent encroachment, and the defeat of a pan-Indian movement to keep settlers out of the Great Lakes region at the Treaty of Chicago in 1821, receiving their final payment before moving westward in 1835. The area is also a site of trade, gathering, and healing for more than a dozen other Native tribes. The state of Illinois is currently home to more than 75,000 tribal members and the Chicagoland area or is currently home to one of the largest and most diverse urban native communities in the U.S. Illinois is also the territory of the Ho-Chunk, Miami, Anoka, Menominee, Sac, Fox, and their descendants. By making a land acknowledgement, we recognize that the indigenous peoples are the traditional stewards of the land that we now occupy, living here long before Chicago was a city and still thriving here today. As we lurk, live, and play on these territories, we must ask what we can do to right the historic wrongs of colonialization and state violence and support indigenous communities struggling for self-determination and sovereignty. So here are some community guidelines that we'd like to go over. Please make sure you show up on time and come prepared. Make sure everyone can participate, listen with an open mind, have mutual respect and appreciation for one another, respect the privacy and personal information shared during class. So today our theme is, um, our topic will be immigration and refugee health, and it will be uh, given by Miss Alejandra Olivia. So Alejandra Olivia is the Community Engagement Manager at the National Immigration Justice Center. In her spare time, she is a writer and translator. Her book, Rivermouth, A Chronicle of Language, Faith, and Migration, is forthcoming in June from Astra House Books. So please... Give a welcome to our speaker, Ms. Alejandra Olivia, and I will turn off my mic and camera so that she has our undivided attention. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for coming tonight. Give me one second while I pull up my PowerPoint and do all of the techie stuff that goes into setting up for this. Uh, hello, everyone, and thank you so, so much for coming. Thanks, especially to, wait, can you all see that? No. Um, give me one second. Sorry. Share screen. Where did it go?
sorry, this is the downside to having 1 million open windows. Um, it is not coming up. Give me one second. I'm sorry, folks. <laughs> Um, in the meantime, I can start talking a little bit about NIJC and what we do, and then um, hopefully I will get my tech issues resolved. Um, so first of all, thank you so much to Washika for inviting me and to Nandini for really organizing and working with me to get everything set up, even as I was like rushing to finish this PowerPoint and do all these things. Um, so thank you so much for bearing with me while I was doing that. Um, I'm really excited to be talking to you tonight about this intersection of immigration and public health, and I'm really looking forward to the discussion afterwards, especially. Um, let me start by talking a little bit about NIJC, which stands for the National Immigrant Justice Center, and then a little bit about myself. So NIJC is a branch of Heartland Alliance, and we are an organization that is dedicated to sharing the sorry, dedicated to ensuring human rights protections and access to justice for all immigrants, refugees, and asylum seekers. And um, we have offices in Chicago, Indiana, San Diego, and Washington, DC. And the vast majority of what we do is provide um, direct services to, I am sorry, my computer is really not cooperating. Okay. Um, we provide direct legal services to people, particularly here in the Chicagoland area. However, I think what makes us unique as an organization is that we're also advocates for these populations through policy reform at the city, state, and federal level, as well as lending our support and research to different organizations in different areas that are engaged in their own advocacy. Um, we also have a team that does impact litigation that's suing the government and other sort of big entities to try and change policy. And we're also, as this presentation might indicate, invested in public education and research in the immigration world. Um, since its founding three decades ago, NIJC has been unique in blending individual client advocacy with broad-based systemic change. So we are able to work with people, you know, from the very beginning to of their cases. And if it makes sense, like take it to advocate for them at the federal level or um, have them join in on a class action lawsuit against the government or whatever the case may be. Okay, let me try sharing my screen again. There it is. All right, there's the stuff about NIJC that I just shared. Um, and then my name is Alejandro Oliva. I'm the community engagement manager at NIJC. I've been working there for about three years now, doing a mix of communications work and then more recently advocacy work. I live in Chicago, uh, as they mentioned earlier, on unceded council of the Three Fires land, the traditional home of the Ojibwe, Odawa, and Potawatomi lands, as well as many other groups that call Chicago their home. Tonight, though, I'm speaking to you from Austin, Texas, the occupied lands of the Tonkawa people, which also house the Apache and Comanche people as they move through the area. Um, I was asked here today to talk a little bit about the intersection of immigrant rights and public health. And I think that the best way to tackle that is to go from the past and sort of the history of exclusion to what we are seeing today, to what we see coming in the future, both on a national and local level, kind of at these intersections. So let's get started. Um, for the past, I want to do a very quick tour of everything prior to the 90s, uh, in part because I think when you're presented with this very, very long view of history, it can feel really overwhelming. But in this case, it's also really important to emphasize that the attitudes that we're seeing today in our immigration policy are attitudes that have been reflected in some of our oldest, oldest immigration laws. And so a lot of what we'll be talking about today purports to be on the issue of public health, but it's actually about things like imagined racial purity or xenophobia or sort of drawing very divisive borders around what it means to be an American. Um, this is evidenced by the fact that we're facing many, many of the same issues uh, in immigration and in racism today, uh, just even as our understanding of public health has changed. 
So our very earliest immigration laws have been in some way also laws about race and disease and contamination. From the 1790s Naturalization Act, which limited US citizenship to free white persons, these laws were interested in keeping a kind of homogeneity and purity in the United States citizenship, big bunny ears around purity. Uh, later on, we have the 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act, which drew on fears of Chinese immigrants as vectors for disease in order to completely ban immigration first from China and then from other countries in Asia. Um, I chose some photos here that are among the few photos that we actually have of uh, images of San Francisco's Chinatown before the earthquake um, taken by a German immigrant named Arnold Gentha. Um, just to illustrate kind of how totally normal and prosaic these uh, cityscapes are, like you're looking at a city with people in it. Um, however, much as in New York City's tenements, which were also full of newly arrived immigrants and also really seen as these dirty sort of disease ridden places, this was less because of the kind of inherent contagion that Chinese Exclusion Act suggests that these immigration populations carry and instead because of the segregated and often overcrowded living situations that recent immigrants found themselves in. Um, not to mention a lack of medical care in large part thanks to prejudice on the part of the medical establishment in many of these cities. Um, so that's kind of the very, very beginnings of our immigration laws. And then to sort of fast forward you through the 19th and 20th centuries, um, I wanted to include a little medley of the different ways and places that ideas of public health, virality, and contagion have sort of imposed themselves on sites of immigration and border crossing. So on the top left here, you will see a photo of a woman being examined, undergoing a medical examination at Ellis Island. Um, on the right, that is a photo of a bracero, who is a Mexican uh, temporary agricultural worker who came in during the Second World War. And um, in addition to a medical examination, they were all also often sprayed down with DDT upon entering sort of in order to get their work papers and be able to actually take part in the guest worker program, make the money to send home to their families. So you see someone there being sprayed down with DDT. And then the picture on the bottom left is recent arrivals at Angel Island, which is, I believe, off the coast of San Francisco. And it's where a lot of initial immigration from Asia sort of happened. And a lot of people call it like the Ellis Island of the West Coast. Um, so the, these are folks being examined for trachoma at uh, Angel Island. These photos are meant as just a very quick literal snapshot of the status quo of immigration and public health of the 19th and 20th centuries. And I think it's pretty striking to see some of the differences in racialization and the different ways that people are being treated in these photos based on where they're from. Um, one quick highlight from this time period that will become important later. In 1944, right around the time that the Bracero program began, we have the passage of Title 42, which is something that you may have heard of in the news a little more recently. Title 42 is a law that enables the Surgeon General of the United States to quote, impose a partial or complete restriction on the introduction of persons and property into the United States to avert the spread of infectious disease. This law remains on the books. It's there, it doesn't really get used, it doesn't really get activated for a number of years. Um, different laws kind of pop up that work similarly to this one, often banning people who are carrying specific diseases, tuberculosis, um, certain STDs, things like that. But Title 42 specifically, we can think of as this sort of dormant virus that is waiting in the law books until conditions are right for it to sort of emerge and cause havoc. And we'll be getting into how that happens in a little bit. So fast forward now to the early 90s, and especially to that first reading that you guys got from Stephen Thrasher's The Viral Underclass. Don't worry if you haven't had a chance to get to it. We will get to a lot of the factual information covered in it, but I do recommend, honestly, not just the excerpt, but the whole book. Um, it's phenomenal. So starting in the 80s, as the HIV epidemic impacted largely what was publicly seen as being communities of queer men in the United States, um, even though its spread was much, much far greater than that, 
Um, United States immigration policies once again reacted to fears of contagion by limiting access to immigration. So in 1987, the Reagan administration, after a lot of inaction on other aspects of AIDS that they could have been taken care of, um, passed a law that required that all of those seeking immigration visas to the US be tested for HIV and AIDS. And these rules only got stricter and more codified as the AIDS epidemic continued. This was particularly true when it came to immigration from Haiti, where there was this perception of HIV and AIDS circulating pretty widely in the population. So you can see here, um, I believe a headline from 1987 um, with all kinds of retrograde language talking about the, the onset of this ban. Um, a quick note on Haiti and its geopolitical situation uh, as before we continue. So Haiti is a former French colony that shares an island, Hispaniola, with the Dominican Republic. Prior to colonization, it was the home of the Taino people, and it was the very first place that Christopher Columbus landed its ship, so, ships. So it was really like among the first places that colonization took hold in the Americas. Um, like many Caribbean former and current colonies, its role in the French empire was as a producer of raw materials. In this case, sugarcane, largely thanks to the labor of enslaved people forcibly brought over from Africa. In the midst of the French Revolution, Haitian enslaved people, freedmen, a mix of people that were living on the island decided to fight for their own uh, liberté, égalité, fraternité, and began the Haitian Revolution under the leadership of the French army's first black general, Toussaint Louverture. In 1804, they finally defeated Napoleon's armies and Haiti became the first independent nation of Latin America and the Caribbean, the second republic in the Americas, the first country in the Americas to abolish slavery and the only state in history established after a su successful revolt of enslaved people. The founding government of the newly established Haitian Republic was also entirely composed of formerly enslaved people. However, all was not well in the newly established Republic of Haiti. As a condition of their surrender and in exchange for diplomatic recognition, in 1825, France demanded to be paid reparations for the loss of property. Here, you should understand that to be the loss of human lives that they felt that they owned. Uh, to the tune of, in today's money, $21 billion. I don't want to get too far into the weeds with uh, that debt and what happened to it and all the different ways it sort of moved around. Um, but it's interesting to note that that debt and interest related to it was eventually bought out by the United States, and many economists and historians argue that this debt and the repayment of it that Haiti was forced to do is one of the foundational reasons that Haiti is today one of the poorest countries on earth. Part of the reason that HIV and AIDS was circulating so broadly among the Haitian people in the 80s and 90s was because of a lack of medical and public health infrastructure in Haiti. This lack of infrastructure is, again, thanks to the general poverty of the country because of these reparations that they had to pay. So back to the 90s. In 1991, a coup d'etat ousted the democratically elected Haitian president, Jean-Bertrand Aristide, and 11,000 Haitians fed the island in boats, many of them headed to claim political asylum in the United States. The US Coast Guard picked them up and they were taken to uh, Guantanamo military base, which you can kind of see here, Miami and Guantanamo and Haiti and sort of the different locations of where people were trying to get to, where they ended up, where they were taken. Uh, there, much as in the pictures that we saw from, you know, centuries previous, people were given really invasive medical exams, given immunizations en masse with kind of regardless of what their actual health needs were and tested for HIV. At Guantanamo, as Thrasher points out, we see the beginnings of what will become a site of indefinite detention and a place where people are under US control but don't necessarily have access to the civil rights and civil liberties that they do if they were actually sort of in the United States proper. For this portion of the presentation, I'll be drawing from both the viral undercraft class by Stephen Thrasher, which was the handout you all got, um, as well as from Let the Record Show, which is Sarah Schulman's incredible oral history of ACT UP in New York City. 
and how they became really involved in questions of immigration justice for HIV positive Haitian immigrants. Um, I note that that book is very focused on ACT UP and its involvement and so has a lot less information about the Haitian community and how they were involved. Um, I have not personally found a good source for this, but um, that's just kind of the limits of the information that I have to share that with you. So of the, of the 11,000 asylees that were picked up by the Coast Guard, about 300 of them tested positive for HIV. And among those that there were women, many of them were forcibly sterilized with depot Provera shots. Shulman also mentions uh, firsthand accounts from volunteers that ended up um, visiting these folks at Guantanamo, uh, horrifying general medical treatment, which included incorrect dosage and just sort of general distribution to everyone of medicines to combat things like TB and HIV without any thoughts on whether those were counterindicated by patient history or uh, even the conditions that they were in. So after this point, these Haitian asylum seekers were held indefinitely in Guantanamo Bay for, oh, there's the two book titles, sorry. <laughs> Um, at this point, these Haitian asylum seekers are held indefinitely in Guantanamo Bay for around a year and a half to two years. And it's the work of both activists like those in ACT UP who work to secure housing and a place to land for these folks, Haitian community organizers in the US. Shulman mentions a publication called Haiti Progress, Progress um, and the Haitians inside the detention center themselves who are organizing and advocating for their own release from within detention. Um, if you're really interested in the sort of nitty gritty legal machinations of that, like the record show is a pretty good source for that. Um, these folks after these two years do end up getting released. They end up getting housing, mostly in New York. Um, and it's a very long sort of path to getting them out and getting them the actual medical attention that they need. Um, there are obviously a lot of layers to the indefinite detention of Haitian asylum seekers in 1991 in Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. We have first the kind of imperialism that the United States is involved with that means that we have a pre-existing military base on an island where we otherwise, particularly at that point, had no diplomatic relations. We have the imperialism that means that despite for many years Haiti paying off their financial reparations to the United States for their own liberation, we felt very comfortable putting over 300 of them in extra legal detention. We also have the layer of racialized and nationalist, nationalistic fears of immigrants and the other that manifested in this immediate testing of this population specifically while they were seeking safety for it while they were seeking safety and immediately just instead of giving them support, testing them for HIV and AIDS and imprisoning them based on that result. Um, I want to be very clear and explicit that the United States government put hundreds of black refugees in a prison camp for years at a time. This layers onto so many other ideas of contagion and purity and, to con and control over Black people and their reproduction that the United States government has often felt very comfortable in exercising. To quote Dr. Thrasher, at Guantanamo Bay, the ostensible justification for this forced sterilization was imagined viral purity. The mere possibility that any Haitians might win their legal appeals and be allowed into the United States was reason enough the eugenicists seemed to have believed to sterilize all the detain detained refugees they thought could carry and birth children with HIV. On that note, um, in 2003, a journalist for The Nation magazine followed up with many of those detained at Guantanamo over a decade earlier and found that many of them were still waiting for their asylum cases to be adjudicated. This is unfortunately not entirely unusual for the United States asylum system, but it's nevertheless the kind of injustice on top of injustice that characterizes our dealings with many immigrants who face cruelty at the hands of the US government. A further sequel from this incident, in 1993, the year that HIV detainees, HIV positive detainees were freed from Guantanamo, President Bill Clinton signed into law a reauthorization of the National Institute of Health that reestablished HIV positive status as a travel ban to the United States. 
this uh, law was not overturned until 22 years later in the year 2010. Um, fast forward once again to the Trump administration to 2018. Sorry for the jump scare. Um, throughout the Trump president, throughout Trump's presidency so far, we see the border and immigration as a major talking point and as an area where he's focused a lot of his most stringent and extreme policies. There's the Muslim ban, which bans immigration from a number of Muslim majority countries. We have the official family separation policy taking shape that spring and summer. We have automatic detention of arriving asylum seekers and a number of other pieces of rulemaking that just make things much, much more difficult for people arriving at the US border seeking protection. It's also in 2018 that Stephen Miller, the man you see here um, behind Trump, who is Trump's close advisor, he begins pushing for total border closure under Title 42, even though at the time there was no major public health emergency, there was nothing except for, once again, these fears of contagion and of like this imagined illness bearing of refugees, asylum seekers, immigrants. Um, he suggests it again in 2019 during a mumps outbreak. And then thanks to the emergence of 2019, of COVID-19, he manages to have it be an enshrined part of policy in March, 2020. At that point, more or less concurrent with the beginning of the COVID pandemic in the US, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC, issued an order in coordination with the Department of Homeland Security, DHS, barring entry of, quote, all non-essential travelers at the southern and northern border. This order suspends the entry of all people arriving at the United States border without valid travel documents, read asylum seekers often, lawful permanent residents, members of the armed forces, and their, oh, sorry, the only exceptions are US citizens, lawful permanent residences, residents, members of the armed forces, and their respective families. So the only people who are able to cross the border are, U.S. citizens, legal permanent residents, and members of the military. Thanks to Miller, we see this dormant virus of Title 42 that had been in the U.S. law code for such a long time sort of come to life. For the first time in U.S. history, the executive branch is citing this law to essentially close the border indefinitely. However, in the time between this law's establishment in 1944 and the moment that it's activated, there have been all of these different changes and advances in our immigration laws. So nearly 40 years after the enactment of Title 42, Congress enacted the Refugee Act of 1980, enshrining the historic policy of the United States to respond to the urgent needs of persons subject to persecution in their homelands. The Refugee Act amended existing law to provide that any non-citizen who arrives in the United States, sets foot in the United States, may apply for asylum. The law is very clear on that. Around that time, the US also signed and ratified the 1967 United Nations Protocol relating to the status of refugees. This is a internationally agreed upon piece of legislation crafted directly in the wake of World War II to prevent another genocide or persecution, political persecution of people around the world. The US's ratification of this means that international principles of non-refoulement, so non-refoulement is the prohibition against returning people to a country where they will be harmed based on an intrinsic characteristic they hold, their gender, their race, their sexuality, um, their political opinion, things like that. So this becomes the law of the land. In short, based on these immigration laws, Customs and Border Protection is barred from, sorry, is barred from returning individuals to a country where they may face life-threatening harm on the basis of a protected ground. And yet when the CDC order is announced, it creates this legal vacuum because it doesn't address the rights of asylum seekers and unaccompanied children at our borders. This, however, does not stop the US government from immediately beginning expulsions for the vast majority of people attempting to cross into the US. As you can see from this chart, in the first year of Title 42, asylum processing numbers, which are the red numbers, the red bars, plunge dramatically and expulsion numbers skyrocket. There's also a key difference here between expulsion and a deportation. A deportation 
is a legal mechanism. And so if you're facing deportation, you have, you can generally expect an opportunity to seek relief from that deportation um, and appear against the law and or again, before a judge and say, this is why I shouldn't be deported because of X, Y, and Z reasons. An expulsion is outside of that process and doesn't give you the opportunity to appear before a court. This rule also enacts a lot of the ugliest impulses of our national history, once again, associating largely black and brown immigrants with disease and infection. The human toll of these expulsions is hard to overstate and it primarily impacts black and brown asylum seekers. Expelled individuals include Haitian asylum seekers and Nicaraguan torture survivors who sought the protection of the US government only to now live in fear for their lives following their unlawful expulsions from the US. Children of all ages continue to be expelled if they are accompanied by a parent or other adult while Title 42 is reviewed, including a two month old Haitian baby. It's also important to note that Title 42 became policy despite outcry from the public health community. Um, uh, Public health officials said that such a law would do little to nothing to help control the pandemic and that putting asylum rights and public health in tension with each other was a false equivalency. Um, this is just one letter that I've screenshotted of dozens of them signed by thousands and thousands and thousands of medical health professionals, public health professionals, immigrant rights advocates, just a number of people saying that Title 42 is, um, bunk based on bad science. I don't want to get too far into the policy weeds here, but there have been a number of court cases and legal challenges of Title 42. In Among the more notable, in February 2021, the Mexican government said that they would stop accepting non-Mexican families as part of Title 42, meaning basically that after this point, only Mexican nationals were uh, subject to expulsion under the law. There are also legal challenges from inside the US. Through about the end of 2021, these are largely from organizations striving to exclude certain populations from the ban or working to end the policy altogether. So you can think of its scope over time getting narrower and narrower. But in early 20, 2022, when the Biden administration announced that they would be winding down the policy, several border states sued to keep it in place. And that case has kind of been ping-ponging back and forth through the various federal courts for the last several months, which more or less brings us to today as far as Title 42 is concerned. However, it is worth our while to see what ICE, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, and the US Immigration Enforcement Apparatus was doing about the pandemic while at the same time enforcing Title 42. So at the height of the COVID-19 pandemic, the Department of Homeland Security was maintaining the same levels of immigration detention and deportation as prior to the pandemic. Immigration detention centers were hotbeds of COVID-19 infection, thanks in large part to a lack of personal protective equipment, and the practice of transferring people from one detention center to another without really checking to see if they had COVID, maintaining any kind of security protocol. It was also discovered later on, I think, that communities around detention centers had especially high levels of COVID-19 in the communities because of people that worked inside the detention centers sort of going back and forth and um, bringing that home to their families. So here's testimony from one of NIJC's former clients, Johannes Favi, on what immigration detention was like at the outset of the pandemic. At the beginning of the outbreak, the facility did not give us any instructions on how to prevent the spread of the virus. No one told us to wash our hands or avoid touching our faces. They did not distribute gloves, masks, or hand sanitizer. The guards did not maintain social distance. They would come close to us and speak to us. It is impossible to practice social distancing in detention. I was housed in an open dorm in a block that held 48 people. The dorm was split into 12 cubicles with dividers and each cubicle had four people sharing one toilet and one sink. We had to line up closely together to receive meals and then sit closely together at a table, just like at a restaurant or food court. So you're seeing people in situations where they can't even take care of themselves or take care not to either get 
or spread COVID if they have it. And that's really scary. Um, Johannes was released from immigration detention in 2020 and is now a community activist with uh, Interfaith Coalition for Detained Immigrants. He's fantastic. Um, the spread of COVID was also compounded because as Thrasher points out, COVID positive individuals were deported from US immigration detention to Haiti and other countries while, with still faltering healthcare systems and a lack of access to vaccines. So this right here is a still from a video co-produced by the Marshall Project in the New York Times in July of 2020. So about three, four months after the, the pandemic really started being an issue that we were talking about. And it tracks over 200 deportation flights between March and July of that year, including to 11 countries that had confirmed deported people that had positive COVID cases. So essentially exporting COVID to at least 11 known countries, possibly more. To bring this conversation to today. Um, on January 5th of this year, the Biden administration announced that it had collaborated with the Mexican government to expand the use of Title 42 again. So at this point, it's only applying to Mexicans starting on January 5th. Um, it expands to also expel asylum seekers from Cuba, Haiti, and Nicaragua, along with Venezuelans who are part of an earlier expansion. There's also been news as recently as last week that as the federal government winds down the COVID-19 state of emergency, that Title 42 will be wound down along with it. Don't worry though, the United States government has another handy dandy policy ready to keep asylum seekers out. Um, the end of Title 42 was essentially announced concurrently with a new ban that would bar people from asylum if they entered the United States without authorization and or if they didn't seek asylum protection in their countries of transit. So let's say someone passes through Mexico in order to get to the US. If they didn't seek asylum in Mexico, then they would be barred from seeking asylum in the US. Um, this ban does essentially the same work as Title 42 does, but it doesn't use public health as an excuse. It's also important to note that bans similar to this were tried and struck down several times during the Trump administration. That brings us up to like the very, very cutting edge of the present. Um, I believe the, the new transit ban was shared two days ago um, as far as immigration policy and public health goes. I now want to talk a little bit about the future and the recommendations that our incredible policy team at NIJC have put together. Um, for humane border policy in the future and the role that you especially as public health professionals and public health future professionals can play in that future. So first of all, there's this idea that the administration, sorry, can and should Number one, develop and support robust communication and planning between federal, state, and local governments and civil society so that those arriving migrants in need of additional support can be matched with a destination with capacity to provide services. Number two, to fully fund and support civil society, including social and legal service providers. A note that when I say civil society, what I'm talking about is um, basically everything that is not the government. So community organizations, hospitals, whatever that is not sort of part of the government. Um, fully fund and support civil society, including social and legal service providers, create non-custodial humanitarian reception centers at the border instead of jailing migrants and asylum seekers. And number four, overhaul the federal immigration budget by moving funds away from detention and enforcement and towards asylum processing and humanitarian needs. While taking these steps, the administration must also abide by its obligation to ensure asylum access to those arriving at the United States borders and ports. Okay, so number one, develop and support robust communication and planning between the federal, state, and local governments and civil society so that arriving migrants in need of additional support can be matched with a place that has the capacity to support them. What does that actually mean? So I think that there's actually a not good, but interesting um, example of this in the migrant buses that we began seeing in the fall here in Chicago, and then in New York and DC and Philly and Martha's, and really memorably Martha's Vineyard. 
So I was involved in NIJC's bus response. I am actually on the left in that picture along with my colleague, Catalina Ramos. Um, and I can tell you that robust communication between different localities was not a part of this process. Um, and we also found that the intent was to overwhelm cities rather than to support migrants. These are things that we knew from the headlines. Um, however, in the process, we saw this really amazing, here in Chicago especially, and I think the news covered Martha's Vineyard a lot um, as well. We saw this really, really incredible, fast, effective mobilization from both local governments and civil society to welcome people. NIJC was one of dozens of organizations at the Welcome Center that the city set up um, that was there to provide, you know, very basic legal orientations to people. We have seen a ton, a ton, a ton of people stepping up and giving their time, their energy, their effort to this. Um, a version of a program like the busing program that actually relies on good communication and that instead of being a political ploy is actually intended to help people um, and that has support from the federal government, financial, logistical, all of it, um, could ensure that all immigrants, not just those that get lassoed into a political sun, receive this kind of welcome. Um, and we're talking about basic medical health care, uh, basic legal orientations, um, a guide to enrolling your kids in school, just really basic things that like you would hope that any city welcomes anyone with, like we, we could be doing that. Um, however, all of you are largely here because I think of your interest in public health rather than your interest in policy. So, uh, or maybe both. But I want to highlight a kind of different aspect of this. There are already immigrants in just about every community in this country. Uh, in fact, oftentimes when people are traveling here, they are traveling to be reunited with their families um, that's already in the state. And there's also an existing but kind of spotty healthcare infrastructure in this country. And I think that the best way to ensure that when X city or Y small town gets a call from the federal government saying, hey, we have a group of people that want to come to your area. Do you have capacity that we can ensure that the resources that are already there are accessible to immigrants, to people with different language needs or with different tech abilities. And that's the kind of work that can start happening today and that will pay off right away. Making things more accessible just means that they are in fact more accessible and more people can access them. That leads me immediately into solution number two, which is to fully fund and support civil society, including social and legal service providers. These critical services cost money. NGOs along the US-Mexico border and throughout the United States are the heart of the US's reception system for arriving asylum seekers. But for too long, they have made do with too little funding and little support from the federal government. And I'm sure that that is true of many, many, many of the organizations that you guys also work with. Um, providing money to all of these organizations will make it far easier for them to do their jobs, the things they're already good at. This is a recommendation that's largely oriented towards the federal government, and uh, most of us are not in charge of the federal government's budget, which is too bad, um, and towards doing those doing budgeting advocacy. But I think that as public health professionals, the place that you come in here is ensuring that the grants and the funding that you get doesn't come with restrictions that could leave out in immigrants or undocumented people or adversely affect folks. So I included here a screenshot from a really great article that was co-produced by Injustice Watch and the Chicago Tribune that highlights this really exciting new program here in Illinois that essentially provides Medicare-like services for undocumented seniors in the state. This is an incredible program. It's filling a huge, huge need, a huge gap in coverage. Um, but as the article goes on to point out, the program excludes a lot of the long-term care facilities that many of the most vulnerable people uh, need access to. So when you're going in and fighting for this funding, fighting for the things that are going to help your community, it's cool to remember that immigrants are usually also part of that community. Um, recommendation number three, create non-custodial humanitarian reception centers at the border instead of jailing my migrants and asylum seekers. So we've just spent a little bit talking about the huge public health risks posed by the sustaining the practice of immigration detention. And yet it is still a default for 
most of the people who do manage to make it across the border. Our earlier discussion also largely covered ICE detention, so Immigration and Customs Enforcement detention, which is a huge part of immigration enforcement, both for people who have recently crossed the border and for people who have been living here in the United States for a long time before they sort of come into contact with the immigration enforcement system. Um, but it's also really important to note that a lot of these really same public health issues also arise at Customs and Border Protection facilities. Um, I've included a picture of one here. Um, just about every single migrant who crosses the border and comes into contact with Customs and Border Protection will spend some time here. Uh, the law limits it, I think, at 48 hours, but it can sometimes be much, much longer. Um, CBP agents themselves will call these facilities kennels because of how punishing and inhumane they are. And I mean, that picture says a lot, I think. Using jail-like facilities to shelter arriving families and individuals seeking safety or a better life in the US criminalizes the very act of migration and puts lives at risk. Instead of this or the sort of uh, still jail but a little nicer model that's been more recently suggested, um, I think what we're asking for is a full departure from these incredibly dehumanizing spaces. Moving to a model like one practiced in some European countries with welcome centers that are not run by a law enforcement agency that don't restrict movement and they're actually strictly time limited for rapid processing of people would be a far healthier and more humane model. Uh, recommendation number four, which I think ties a little bit back into number two as well, is to overhaul how immigration policy is budgeted by moving funds away from detention and enforcement and towards asylum processing and humanitarian needs. So we usually call this a divest invest model. By taking away money from immigration detention, we can free up that money to invest it where our values and the values of our community are in taking care of people. To give you an idea of what these um, numbers look like right now, for fiscal year 2023, um, Congress provided $2.8 billion for Immigration and Customs Enforcement's detention system, that's the very bottom bar, but only $800 million to uh, support local governments and NGOs providing humanitarian services and reception for arriving migrants. That is the bar you cannot see. Um, it's like a little, little fingernails worth of green there. The bill funded CBP's border security operation at $6.4 billion, that's the really big bar but only provided 3.5 billion, the top bar, for domestic field operations that are responsible for processing, including asylum screenings at ports. Uh, the humanitarian support line again on there is so slim as to be invisible. And finally, and most foundationally, the administration must respect and maintain at all times, the fundamental right of migrants to seek asylum at the border, regardless of manner of entry or transit. I think that this is the right that all the other ones that we've discussed is built on. The right to asylum is one that was hard won and established in the aftermath of the Holocaust. It's United States law, it is international law, and it's broadly supported by people in the US. We've seen over the last several years what it can look like when this right is eroded, and we've discussed tonight what that looks like when it's eroded in the name of public health. Um, the Guantanamo detentions of HIV positive Haitians happened just a few years after the ratification of the 1980 Refugee Act, and even fewer years after our ratification of the UN's language around refugees. That means we've never really had the opportunity to see what it would look like for us as a country to accept asylum seekers, regardless of their manner of entry or what country they're from. We've never had that opportunity to live up to our promise as a country. Thank you so much for your time. Yes. Oh, yes, definitely. Hand clap emoji. Thank you so much for that presentation. I think that giving uh, the historical heft and context to what we're experiencing today not only allows us to look at the injustices that have happened, um, which many of us will obviously like really take to heart, but also the coalition building and the solutions, right? So that we are in a space where we see these things happening, but we also recognize that we can do something about it. And I think that's also the most in, in important thing to take away from this, that we as either healthcare professionals, future health professionals, or people who are <clears throat> invested in 
rights and um you know public wealth health and welfare sorry public health and welfare um have a chance to be involved into writing these historic wrongs that we can see have these very deep historical um roots in um you know racism or, or classism or other types of isms um that manifest in different spaces and so we do have a couple of questions to ask um and so these questions will also the ones that were chosen will also be given um will also be put in the chat so one is that are there currently bills being introduced to work um are there currently bills being introduced to work toward these uh recommendations the ones that you had mentioned in your um in your presentation um i am not aware of any specifically right now that are in progress we are in kind of a tricky spot with congress right now because of the divided house i know that there is a new dreamer bill provision hopefully going in. i saw some people chatting about the dream act in the chat um and there's there's some of this stuff going on i think that there's also a lot of active campaigning going on for more funding to be given to folks um to big in that $800 million pot a little bit um, to help people pay for the services that many places are already just kind of providing. Um, but I'm not sure about any specific laws. These are, to be clear, like where these policy recommendations came from, these are uh, recommendations that our policy team came up with, um, specifically our policy director, Heidi Altman, who is phenomenal. Um, sort of came up with as like, you keep saying there's a problem, here's actually what we see as being the solution. Thank you, yeah, and I'm like I said, I'm really glad that people are providing both because I do think that for some people it is easier to brush off, oh, it's a problem, what are we gonna do? And then uh, kind of leave it at that. But I think that solution, uh, oriented things uh, lean us more toward action. Uh, so the next question is, is there anything being done against or should there be any repercussions for people like DeSantis and others who are involved in the Martha's Union incident and other similar moves? Um, I believe that DeSantis specifically is facing an investigation by a sheriff in San Antonio, which was the origin point of a lot of the people that he um, got onto that airplane. Other than that, I don't believe that there is too much happening on the legal front to some of these governors, but um, I'm not sure about that. And it usually takes a while to pull together cases like this. And it's only been a couple of months now since this started happening, as difficult as that is to believe. So um, that is sort of where that status is. Uh, we may see more things in the future, but I don't know. So um, the next one was, when thinking about the Guantanamo Bay reading and the deportation issue of Haitian asylum seekers that still continues to this day, what can be done when even so-called progressive legislators are enacting these racist policies just as much as any conservative administration? How can we hold legislators accountable on this issue? Yeah, this is a really good question. And um, I think a really complicated one that, you know, we, I feel like there are so many people working to hold the United States accountable for so, so, so many historic ills that they've done um, to varying effects. And so I think that um, in the last couple of years, we have seen, um, especially Ukrainians uh, during the onset of the war were granted some very specific um, parole programs that worked really well for them because there are a lot of really established Ukrainian communities already here in the United States. So people who needed sponsors, had sponsors, often had family community members that were able to step up and do that. We've seen those same programs applied to um, Venezuelans, Nicaraguans, Haitians, and Cubans. And those are less effective sometimes because there are often fewer people already here who are ready, willing, able to sponsor folks. Mm -hmm. um, but I think asking for, um, demanding that asylum 
is a fundamental right that everyone has, regardless of how they entered, where they're from, um, what, how they arrived here, um, feels like a really important thing to continue reiterating and um, to keep talking to Congress. It's important, or I've found it at least individually really interesting that a lot of this policy has happened not by acts of Congress, but by um, these sort of agencies that are coming together um, and voting, or and not even voting on things. Um, they're all sort of policy that's passed in the federal register. It's never a law that anyone votes on. And that's really frustrating to me because it feels like I wouldn't vote for these policies. I wouldn't want these things to happen. Um, and it's still sort of getting churned through, even when it's a government that uh, aligns with what I voted for, as this person mentioned. And so I think reminding Congress, asking Congress that this is an issue that matters to you, that you want to see them take action on this, um, is a good step towards that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. And I think that um, having their records of what they support, not just what they vote for, but the things that they support is this is really important, especially when we talk about election cycles and things like that. Um, <clears throat> uh, in programs such as the program in Illinois, which provides Medicare services for undocumented migrants, where does the funding from these programs come from? Um, I believe it comes from, you know, government money, taxpayer funds. I'm not totally mm -hmm. sure about like the funding sources for that quick note here, it's important to note that many, 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 many undocumented immigrants pay taxes. Um, yeah. They are, you know, working, they often come in with some kind of paper, they have deductions, just like you and me, they just can't claim those deductions back because uh, they are working under different social security numbers and don't actually file taxes, but they do end up paying them out of deductions and stuff. So, um, yeah, there's a bunch of money in state and federal treasuries that come from undocumented people. Yeah, so because I know that's also the case with a lot of um, Dreamers and DACA students as well, um, where they will pay, depending on their things, um, pay uh, various like uh, taxes and things like that. And also I know states have their own expansion programs. Um, as someone who does work with disability uh, rights organizations, there are other programs that are additional programs um, to Medicaid that states will pick up or not. Um, and that, yeah. that helps the quality of life of the people who live in the state. Um, so the other one was, um, I would like to know if there are any countries that have a better, more humane immigration policy that we could try to emulate or enact here in the U.S., uh, which countries have the most streamlined, equitable immigration policies, and what could we do differently here in the USA? That is a great question. Um, I think that we are seeing a lot of really similar issues as we're facing in the United States as in a lot of other countries. Um, a lot of other countries uh, do the same thing that we do or are doing through things like Title 42 and the migrant or the Return to Mexico Migrant Protection Protocol mm -hmm. program um, that basically pushes asylum seekers, pushes refugees to locations outside of our borders. Um, like for example, Australia has Christmas Island and Nauru, which are two uh, islands in the Pacific that were essentially like purchased from indigenous people who live there and now serve as basically refugee camps for people um, who are not yet allowed to enter Australia proper. Um, the EU has places like Lesbos, which function as a really similar situation. Um, I don't know that there is any one country that we can look to and say their entire immigration system is one to emulate. I think that there are little bits and pieces um, that other countries are doing better. There's little bits and pieces that we do okay at, but um, in general, I think that the thing that we need to remember is that we have an international legal obligation to provide asylum for people, particularly because of our legacy of 
colonialism, racism that has helped us uh, become a country that a lot of people think of as prosperous. Mm -hmm. um, and um, just kind of remembering that that's an obligation that we have towards the world. Yeah. Um, thank you so much. So that is the time we have for questions today because we have to uh, transition to the next section. Thank you so much for coming. Um, and we would um, love to thank everyone for the questions and the chat. The chat was on fire tonight. I really enjoyed reading um, the comments from the chat and I really appreciated all of you for um, not only speaking in the chat, but responding to one another. That is, I love the engagement because um, even though we're not with one another, I think that we have a really, I think the way we're sharing knowledge with one another is important. So the um, PowerPoint will be available on the Google site and on Blackboard, do not worry. Um, and we will transition. So in about, in about, I will open the other chat. So for all of our community members, have a great night. We will see you next week. And for all students, we will be transitioning to our other chat and we will have about five minutes. So at 6.38, we will start our next uh, section. So I would like to thank our host again and uh, we will see you all in the, um, in the next uh, room.